My name is uh, Hubert Ivory, and um, I am a retired United Methodist minister. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Advocacy and Justice Committee of the California Nevada Annual Conference, of which I am the chair. My bishop, Minerva Kakanya, is our bishop, and I'm happy to be your moderator for today. So I want to, um, um, before we um, get started, I want to open us up with a, a little bit of uh, meditation and also tell you a little bit about this uh, workshop. Uh, so I am going to uh, begin a, uh, uh, a slideshow in a momentarily. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, so this, um, as I said, this uh, webinar is being sponsored by uh, the Advocacy and Justice Committee and we're part of the California uh, Nevada Annual Conference. And so this um, uh, webinar is about uh, an issue that all of us care dearly about and that is nuclear, the threat of, neutral, uh, of nuclear um, uh, disasters. And, and um, you know, how imminent is this threat and, and how concerned should we be about it? Uh, and so this, this is gonna be part of our discussion today. Uh, before we get, um, begin, I just want to just remind us that we've already, we already know what this kind of disasters look like and, and it's gonna be many times over uh, than the ones that was uh, experienced in uh, uh, Fukushima and other places in, in Japan. Uh, so I just want us to take a moment just to uh, have a, a, a moment of silent reflection and, um, and just um, we bring to our, our mind the idea that we don't ever want something like this to happen again uh, and that we want to do all that we can to make sure that it doesn't happen. Let's just have a moment of silence and we remember those who died from such disasters and those who are working to prevent it in the future. We give God thanks for healing and for the prevention and that will come in this effort. Amen. So um, let me begin uh, by just um, saying this. Um, uh, we live in a world Uh, we live in a world uh, where the threat uh, of a major nuclear event has never been higher. We hear every day news about advances being made by countries in, in China and uh, North Korea, Russia, uh, and, as well as in the US about the procurement and delivery of nuclear weapons. The Arms Control Association says that the world's nuclear armed um, states possess a combined total of nearly 13,500 nuclear warheads. More than 90% belong to Russia and the US alone. Approximately 9,500 warheads are in military service with the rest uh, waiting for disarmament. Uh, in brief, um, scientists, uh, uh, say that besides the immediate destruction of cities of nuclear of a nuclear blast uh, or blast, the potential aftermath aftermath of uh, a nuclear war could involve firestorms, a nuclear winter, widespread 
uh, radiation sickness, from fallout, and or the temporary, if not permanent loss of much of modern technology due to electromagnetic pulses. Uh, so, but how exactly real is this threat? Uh, that is what, that is, this is what our panelists is going to talk to us today about. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you our panelists. And so I'm going to introduce to you Reverend uh, Nobu uh, uh, Han Hanoka, and he will in turn introduce our other panelists. Uh, following the introduction, each of our panelists will, have a, uh, will make a brief presentation. After the presentation, we will entertain questions. Uh, you may use the Q&A or chat uh, windows to, to ask questions to our panelists. At the conclusion of our time, we will share uh, some ways that you can get involved with this uh, crucial uh, uh, issue of trying to avert a nuclear disaster. Um, so at this time, I want to welcome our guests. I want to show them appreciation for being here. Um, I want to first introduce uh, 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 Nobuke um, Ananoka. Um, Nobu was an, an infant when the atomic bomb was detonated over uh, uh, Nagasaki. He has no memory of the disaster of the city, but lost his mother and sister and later his brother to radiation poisoning. He can share his personal experience of the terror of radiation exposure. Nobu. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Hubert. And for your advocacy and justice committee for uh, making this webinar session possible. And good evening and welcome to all of you who are listening. I'm delighted this evening to welcome our two wonderful guests, Malia Kelly of Livermore and Seth Sheldon of New York for sharing their expertise in today's program. As executive director of Tri-Valley Cares, Ms. Marilia Kelly has been monitoring the US nuclear policies and the weapons program at Livermore Lab, uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, National Lab Laboratory. Uh, for 38 years, and she is the person who has the most accurate knowledge and of uh, what is taking place behind those fences in, at Livermore. Uh, she has uh, testified before the U.S. Congress and, and the California legislature, and she will be able to tell us today uh, about the current uh, U.S. policy on nuclear weapons and uh, what is in production uh, at Livermore. And, and uh, Mr. Seth Sheldon is the United Nations liaison for the International uh, Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons commonly known as ICANN. ICANN was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for the work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and uh, for its groundbreaking uh, efforts to achieve uh, uh, treaty-based prohibition of such weapons, namely the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, known as TPNW. Uh, Mr. Sheldon assists governments in signing and ratifying the TPNW and the, promotes the treaties uh, universalization. Although Mr. Sheldon's uh, activities are based in primarily in New York, she is no stranger to the Bay Area or Northern California. 
as he holds his uh, law degree from the UC Berkeley Law School and, and uh, has a certificate in nuclear safeguards policy from Middlebury Institute uh, of International Studies at Monterey. This evening, we will have an opportunity to learn more about the treaty and its uh, significance to us all. Please hold your questions until all three panelists have spoken. And at that point, you, you have, we have a ample time to ask questions and you can uh, address your questions to any one of us. At this point, allow me to say a few words about my experience. I was born on Christmas Day in 1944, which means uh, on August the 9th, 1945, when the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. I was only eight months old, baby. Naturally, I have no personal recollection of the bomb, uh, bombing itself and the hellish devastation and desolation immediately following the uh, explosion. But according to uh, those who witnessed the devastation and desolation of the city of Nagasaki, and survived it, nuclear, the nuclear explosion was followed by the sudden expansion of air, which created a tremendous uh, violent wind, which crushed uh, almost all the structures in the city. Thousands of people died, crushed under the collapsed building. And then seconds later, uh, a huge fireball was formed in the midair, and it grew and grew. And 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 um, the fireball was created by the massive amount of uh, uh, thermal X-rays from the explosion and it reached uh, tens of millions of uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, which is, was hotter than the interior of the sun. And when it touched down on the ground, it, every, it vaporized everything it touched. And the whole city was incinerated. And, and uh, The people who, many of the people who were caught in the fire, the city-wide fire, were killed, burned to death. And, and uh, uh, those who survived the initial impact of the fire, uh, they said that they looked like ghosts because skins are all peeled and and uh, hanging from the tip of their hands and eyeballs popped out and they were crying. They were asking for water. I'm burning, I'm hot, give me water. Uh, and and uh, those bodies are still smoldering. The, the wind, violent wind and and deadly fire killed almost a quarter of a million people uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. In the city of Nagasaki, there was the largest Christian congregation at that time with a membership of 18,000. Uh, that day, 12,000 of the 18,000 members were killed. 
and and uh, the once la the largest church uh, in in the whole Asia of Asia uh, became the church of uh, only six thousand membership. Um, but what was most the most uh, insidious was the invisible and seemingly harmless uh, radioactive particles. It spread into the atmosphere and uh, came down in the rain. It contaminated the air and and the uh, water as well. The city water reservoir was contaminated with a large amount of radiation, radioactive particles. And and uh, my family. Uh, lived far enough from the, the center of the explosion and we were able to avoid the, the violent wind and the fire, but there's no way to avoid the, the contamination from the air and the water because we had to breathe and we had to drink. So as far back as I can remember, both my mother and my sister were sick in bed, looking pale and weakly, weak. They finally died when I was six. A few years later, my brother also died uh, and the doctor could not uh, determine the cause of the death. The only thing he said was after the autopsy, his internal organs were not those of the young man, but of the uh, old man. So there is a premature aging of the internal organs, uh, but they did not know what killed him even at the late. We suspected the delayed effect of radiation. When my sister died, my father asked the doctor, what is going to happen to the rest of the family? And the doctor said, each individual reacts to radiation differently. So it's, it's difficult to say exactly what is going to happen to each one of you. But the youngest one, Nobu, may not live to see his 10th birthday. So I figured that uh, I have three and a half years to live. I was so scared and shocked that I was not able to utter a word for a few months. I think the thought of my premature death, possible death, uh, kept me in church and, and uh, helped me take my faith seriously. What usually happens to those who were exposed to radiation, whether inhaled or ingested, uh, the uh, radioactive particles is that uh, residual radiation uh, gets into the bone marrow and stays there for many, many years and compromising the immune system, the body's immune system. Uh, making us susceptible to 
uh, cancer, leukemia, and all other kinds of uh, sick illnesses. And we tend to suffer uh, all kinds of diseases all life. Those of us who call them ourselves Hibaksha, those who are su survivors of the A bomb, uh, whenever we meet one another, we say to each other, those who are, who are killed in the blast or the fire were the lucky ones because they didn't have to deal with so many sickness all life. The atomic bomb detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th, 1945, were small and rudimentary nuclear weapons. Only 10 and 12 kilotons re uh, respectively. Yet they reduced the entire cities into ashes and caused unspeakable human sufferings killing nearly a quarter of a million instantly and leaving those who survived with initial, uh, survived the initial effect of bombings to continue to suffer various radiation related illnesses for the rest of their lives. During the 75, 76 years, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There has been a remarkable progress in science and technology. And today's nuclear weapons uh, are much larger, more destructive, more sophisticated, and more accurate. The world has invested tens of trillions of dollars in the production and maintenance of such weapons, squandering precious resources that could have been used for the development of humanity and the elimination of poverty. Today, the size of the nuclear warhead uh, is described not by kilotons, but megatons, millions of tons of TNT. And the destructive power of, the, of today's thermonuclear weapons is at least 10,000 times more than those that dis destroy Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thousands of nuclear warheads still loom in silos and on uh, submarines around the world, posing a real and imminent threat to our very existence. Any use of nuclear weapons, in, in, intentional or accidental, no matter how limited its scope, would have catastrophic humanitarian and environmental consequences affecting future generations to come. The radioactive fallout would encircle the whole globe. The nuclear web winter will cause worldwide uh, starvation and millions will suffer from radiation expo exposure and die the most painful prolonged deaths like my mother and my sister and my brother. Citing the tension and the high level of uh, mistrust in today's world, 
the UN Secretary General, and Antonio Guterres, alerted us that the world today stands on the brink of a new Cold War. This year alone, China, with whom we have no uh, arms control treaty, added 100, 160 new silos in the deserts, each containing the intercontinental ballistic missiles with multiple warheads. And the one unpredictable state of North Korea continues testing their ballistic missiles. Iran is increasing the nuclear capabilities. A nuclear arms race is back on again. We need to stop this madness. It is immoral, inhumane, and now it's illegal to develop weapons of global annihilation. It does not make sense. When we have banned chemical and biological weapons, yet we are still developing or racing to develop more nuclear weapons. On July 7, 2017, however, history was made at the United Nations Assembly, General Assembly when 122 countries voted to adopt the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, TPNW. And in January of this year, it became a binding international law to categorically ban the development, testing, production, stockpiling of nuclear weapons. Yet, the nine states, including the United States, that have active nuclear weapons program have so far completely ignored the treaty. I've written to the President Biden and uh, Nancy Pelosi that my dream is United States taking the leadership in bringing all these nine nuclear weapon states to a table of negotiation and start discussing dismantling of all these weapons of global annihilation and perhaps sign a peace treaty with each other. So I join today all the hibakshas in Japan and elsewhere in pleading with all uh, conscientious and peace-loving people in the world to pray for a compassionate, peaceful, and nuclear-free world. And I urge all the political leaders, congressional representatives, uh, to move swiftly to ratify and implement the treaty on uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons. This is my prayer. Uh, my colleagues uh, will agree with me. Let's see, uh, Melia is not here yet. Do, do we know? Uh, we don't have her yet, so we'll uh, continue on with uh, Seth. 
Thank you, uh, Nobu, for your uh, sobering account of sharing your story and, and also reminding us of the, uh, of the uh, luring or looming uh, disaster if we don't take steps. So now we're going to hear uh, from uh, Seth, uh, who's going to share his uh, story or his information. Thank you for joining us. No, no, thank, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Hanaoka, for the introduction as well, um, and for this this perfect setup. Really, I mean, everything that uh, you spoke about uh, to me is such so powerfully testifies to what the earliest iterations of atomic weapons can do. Uh, and as you said these risks have become so much greater than they were then based in part on, well, for a number of reasons, but, uh, but including because the weapons that we have today are, are held by so many more people are so many, so many more actors and are so much more powerful uh, by uh, many orders of magnitude more than what was used in uh, the, uh, in the US attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and we know that unless we make uh, a meaningful change and a, and a quick change, uh, as is, is the case with our climate uh, catastrophe, that, that these weapons will be used again if we keep the status quo, whether by accident or on purpose. And, and that, that could very well spend, spell the, the, the end of humanity, certainly as we know it. And uh, so your remarks really are a perfect setup uh, for talking about the best solution that we have, which you also introduced. Um, and what others can do to support it. So as you said, the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, sometimes the TPNW, or sometimes called uh, the Nuclear Ban Treaty, just became law earlier this year. And it is the first globally applicable treaty to enter into force that comprehensively prohibits nuclear weapons. And it was, well, it was the result of, of a lot of work over uh, seven decades of, of activism, of activists, and um, uh, of governments that were willing to to push the envelope on this issue. Uh, but born out of what uh, uh, you were just speaking about, about this this concern that 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 these weapons will be used again, um, and out of a growing understanding about the dire consequences that would result from any such use. Uh, the arsenals that are held by um, that 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 are held by these nine nuclear armed states are so much more powerful than the those those early weapons where they make them look like you know colonial muskets by comparison, uh, as you said. But we also know, as as uh, as you had also said, um, Reverend Hanalka, uh, that that even. The, 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 the climate risks uh, are so much more dire than we previously understood that even a limited exchange of nuclear weapons would be far more consequential uh, than, than was previously understood. And we have recent studies from climatologists showing this. And, and these concerns combined with a frustration over the fact that nuclear armed states are not going to lead us on their own toward a world free of nuclear weapons. And in fact, have been doing quite the opposite. They've been increasing their spending on nuclear weapons, investing in new nuclear weapons, all while stringing the world along by failing to meet the commitments they had already made. This is what led non-nuclear armed states to stop waiting and to assume a leadership role themselves. And it's something that we haven't in the US, I think, been hearing uh, enough about. Uh, the media has been focusing only on big power struggles. Even many of the activists in this space, I think, focus uh, are drawn into the inside the beltway discussions and are focused on moving this very stagnant needle, uh, pushing for incremental steps. But meanwhile, the vast majority of the world uh, has lined up behind this more meaningful demand of total abolition. And it's been inspired by the success of other disarmament treaties, such as the Mine Ban Treaty and the Cluster Munitions Convention, that were similarly brought about over the objections of the states that possessed these weapons, the subject weapons, in partnership with civil society. Um, and again, this has uh, been the result of 76 years of advocacy um, uh, from, from civil society, 
starting um, in Hiroshima in it itself when the Red Cross was there on the ground to immediately report on the unconscionable effects. Uh, and then to the Hibak show, who we are still very lucky to have with us, whose testimony continues to be our most important warning, uh, the doctors and scientists who continue to try to convey the effects of nuclear weapons um, and uh, on the climate and on environment and, and on, on people. Um, so ICANN was founded, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons was founded in 2007 uh, with the mission to unite those in civil society that believe that the only practical solution will be a prohibition treaty and to work with those governments to, that will support it to bring it about. Um, and uh, so that's what we did. Uh, we started um, in, in a few years later working with uh, the supportive governments of uh, particularly Mexico, Austria, and Norway to bring about this, what we call the humanitarian pledge uh, that was signed by 127 states. Um, and they were uh, looking to reframe the debate as something that's not just concerned with the security of states, but rather with people. And uh, the recognitions of the obvious is what led to uh, is support for proceeding with negotiations. Uh, so the negotiations happened uh, in 2017, uh, and that's the, when the conference was taking place to negotiate the treaty at the UN. And on July 7th, 2017, as was just said, the treaty was adopted by uh, a vote of 122 states. Uh, as uh, the Reverend also said, you know, what is it? So it's the it's um, it, it does a few things. Uh, most notably, for a lot of people, are, are the core prohibitions that. Were just read out. This this make it everything to do with nuclear weapons illegal for those states that join it. Um, it, it also provides a framework for total elimination uh, by first reinforcing safeguards for non-nuclear weapon states, preventing uh, helping prevent them uh, from ever acquiring nuclear weapons, and also eventually uh, offering a pathway for nuclear armed states when they eventually join to to then disarm. Uh, and requiring that disarmament be verified. Uh, the treaty also, one other thing I'll mention that it does is uh, that it breaks new ground with its um, provisions around victim assistance and environmental remediation. Uh, and so there's, for the first time, a, a, an international law uh, to provide support for affected communities. And victims from nuclear weapons are not only, of course, the Japanese survivors of the US attacks in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also communities worldwide, although primarily in the Southern hemisphere, primarily states in, 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 uh, with large uh, former col col colony colonies of nuclear armed states and uh, indigenous populations. But these communities that have suffered from uranium mining and nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific and Kazakhstan in Northern Africa, and in the United States, of course, through through Western regions of the United States, and finally, we have um, you know the, a lot of the these the survivors and and affected communities have been advocating for for compensation and 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 remediation for the damage that has been done in those uh, communities for a long time, also uh, and and getting very little. Uh, and now we have this international new standard that we can use to advocate for, for changing that. Um, so in July 2017, the treaty was adopted. In December 2017, ICANN won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, in, in September uh, 2018, the treaty opened for signature, uh, 2017, sorry, and, and ICANN spent the next three years working with supportive governments to uh, bring about signature and um, ratification. And ICANN, I should say, works through its partners in every country. Today, we have over 600 partner organizations in 106 countries. Uh, and so with them, we went and tried to bring about getting these supportive states to join. This is a long process uh, in each, each government has its own you know, process that goes through usually has a parliamentary element to it and uh, a governmental element to it. So it takes a while, but um, <clears throat> uh, uh, by the treaty's terms, for all treaties, by the way, uh, but by the treaty's terms, we needed 50 ratifications for the treaty to enter into force. Um, that happened, um, actually it happened on the very day 
that we commemorated the 75th anniversary of the UN itself. October 24th of 2020 uh, was the entry into force, 75th anniversary of the entry into force of the UN Charter. And it also happened to be the day that we secured the 50th ratification to the TPNW from Honduras. So that triggered the TPNW's entry into force 90 days after that, meaning that on January 22nd of this year, 2021, the treaty entered into force. So now, um, and what's happening now, it's, and now it's, it's, it's really incumbent upon us as concerned citizens uh, to, from everywhere, from all walks of life, to support this treaty as our, our best hope for bringing about total elimination. Uh, there's not going to be another global elimination treaty. This is the one we have. And I think anyone who believes that nuclear weapons should be eliminated must, must be working for it, working for all states to join. Uh, and trying to use it to, to change the dialogue and to make sure that nobody ever talks about nuclear weapons or nuclear deterrence without really focusing on the humanitarian consequences and the fact that, that, that the rest of the world knows that this is necessary. We can't be, as, a, as, a, you know, as humanity, we can't be held hostage by these, by these few leaders in these nine nuclear armed states that, to be honest, are be really being driven by corporate interests and and the and the nuclear weapons industry. Um, you know, the fact that this treaty has gotten as far as it's gotten without the support of the nuclear armed states is both impressive and unfortunate, but it was definitely necessary. Uh, and in fact, it was key to the success of the treaty in its early stages. And again, we were following the model of these other treaties landmines, cluster munitions that that similarly had to succeed without the support of the possessor states. Um, and then they became law. And even though the resistors of those treaties wouldn't join it, still haven't joined it, say it doesn't apply to them, we know that it's reduced the dangers from those weapons because it shifted norms and it's even shifted behavior even from those resistant states. And that's what we're trying to do here. And, and this is the reason why sometimes the TPNW is is credited as being something that's really like a civil society treaty. It's not, it's a governmental treaty, but civil society in, has played such an important role and needs to continue to do so. I mean, it has to be our job to stigmatize these prohibited behavior, even in the states that resist it by insisting that, you know, and we have this new tool to help us, that, that these weapons are uh, not just immoral as they always have been, but illegal, and above all, really stupid, um, you know, we can use this to shift norms, to shift behavior, and ultimately make the weapons not just less legal, but also less relevant. Um, and, you know, we have the support from now we know it's uh, all, probably over 135 countries of the world, so more than two thirds of the world states that have stated that they support the treaty. Many of them are in the process of joining. We have 55 states parties so far, so five more since January. Uh, 86 of them have signed. We expect more soon. Next week is um, the high level we get the UN, so we expect a couple of new states to join then. Um, you know, and for the states that have already joined, they are obligated not just themselves not to acquire nuclear weapons, it goes way beyond that. You know, they're obligated not to assist in any, any state in any of the prohibited activities. And that has an immediate impact even on the nuclear armed states. Um, just to take one example, you know, it's now illegal for those states to invest in nuclear weapons. So sovereign wealth funds and institutional funds from, from the state's parties already began divesting. And, and that's, that's, you know, that, that's going to have a massive impact on this really what's a, an economic structure, structural problem with nuclear weapons. By, by changing the financial incentives to invest, uh, this is how nuclear weapons will become less important. And so even in countries that are not parties, like in the US, you know, come participate in, in our divestment campaigns. A lot of this is guided by the research of Don't Bank on the Bomb. Um, a, a, a report that's put together by PAX in the Netherlands, but there's basically you know 27 or so country uh, companies rather that are driving this this proliferation problem uh, in the U.S. Um, so for those of us in the U.S., you know first of all we know that um, well ICANN has has a number of tools that that you know I'd like to direct you to, um, for example the the ICANN legislators pledge or parliamentary pledge. That's a tool we use in all nuclear armed states 
to get parliamentarians and Congress people to pledge that they will work for their country to sign and ratify the treaty. So you can ask your Congress people to do this. Um, you can, you know, as, as um, the Reverend was just saying, you can write to your our government too and our presidential leaders and ask them to do this, to, to support the treaty, to join the treaty. Um, we also have the ICANN Cities Appeal, which some of you may have heard about. Uh, this is a project uh, by which city governments, municipalities, you know, states in some cases can adopt resolutions calling for their national governments to sign and to ratify the treaty. And this has a major impact because it helps ICANN show both show the world really that that you know that this 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 proliferation of nuclear weapons that that we see from these nine states is is not what this what the populations want this is you know a governmental choice um and hundreds of cities have already joined the i can cities appeal um from paris to sydney uh, in the united states from los angeles to washington dc and and you can get your city to join as well we're always looking for um further engagement and and uh, connecting with people who can help with this in their city. So please reach out to us. And last but not least, I'll say, you know, that faith groups in general have been very active in advancing this treaty. Um, a wide coalition of, of faith-based communities from around the world have, have worked together uh, to help bring their countries on board and also to, um, you know, influence uh, other other communities of faith too, um, and that includes the Methodists. I should say. I mean, on 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 the day of entry into force, um, in coordination with that that event, uh, United Methodist Church General Board of Church and Society joined a group pledging uh, their support for the TPNW, endorsing it, and calling on countries to sign and to ratify it. So. Um, so this is a really crucial time uh, to line up behind the treaty, to be really unambiguous in your support for it. The first meeting of states parties is in March of next year. Um, and by that time, we really need a clear call um, from, from citizens to say that, that, that the status quo is unacceptable and we need uh, to bring about a change. I mean, the it, it's, it, it's really amazing to me have to, to be on this journey because I think that I've I've seen how countries will say something as if it's just going to be forever, as it's the case forever. You know that they're that they're just not going to do something, and that this is the position of their country, and it changes. It changes because of the work of civil society, uh, and especially in democracies, obviously, you know where where citizens can have more uh, of a voice. Um, but that's, you know, we work where we are, and, um, and I really believe that we're on the right path. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both Seth and Nobu, for your uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, at this time, I'd like to um, encourage those of you who are listening uh, to uh, submit questions. Uh, you can do that via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen or also uh, through the chat. So if there are questions, uh, you can, uh, uh, can answer them at this time. To get us started, I, I like to um, uh, pose a question to the both of you. And um, my question is, um, uh, why do you think, um, uh, what do you think is driving or contributing to this nuclear proliferation at this time? I'm happy to let um, to defer to uh, first, <laughs> unless you want me to go first. Well, either way. So why don't you go ahead? I'll follow up. You know, if I had to pick one thing, um, I would say it was I would say it was money. I would say that the the intransigent problem uh, has been you know, as, as our early leaders warned us it would be, I mean, has been the military industrial complex. Um, and the fact that there, we have corporatized uh, this, this incentive to continue to build. I mean, if Mary Leo uh, were to join us, I think she would be talking a lot about um, the US budget 
that um, that keeps keeps expanding, you know, and in in how, what what an incredible travesty it's it was that even in 2020 during the pandemic that we decided to you know when when we didn't have enough ventilators and hospitals and masks and and gowns and protective you know PPE and we're all talking about and we're still talking about because people are continuing to die for lack of hospital beds that were that we decided to spend you know billions more on nuclear weapons something that that even even our our military leaders readily concede we can't actually ever use i mean we couldn't use at a certain point you know as is often said you're just blowing up rubble i mean there's no there's no there's no contingency on which you know any one of these weapons would ever make sense but to have all of them and to build more is the height of insanity and i think the that to answer the question i think you look at who benefits from it and largely we are talking about certain leaders in power uh, but in particular um, you know, corporate leaders. And that's a revolving door, by the way. A lot of the leaders who come from, uh, you know, military boards go back into politics in some way and, and then out again. So it's, it's, it's that money. And, and that's the cycle that I think we are poised to undermine uh, with, with the treaty, actually, by, by changing um, the incentive structure for, um, for investments and to make these things less less valuable. Thank you. To uh, uh, Marilia is somewhere, somehow in the system. She says she got it. So would you find her? I will, I'll try. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the, I think the military, uh, complex is, is the big reason for continuing our madness. Uh, but also I think the excuses we have, I mean, the, our country has given is that, uh, you know, it, it, nu having nuclear weapons uh, keep us safe. Uh, from the uh, nuclear attacks from other nations. Uh, it's so-called deterrent, but it hasn't deterred anything. It has encouraged other states uh, to develop their own nuclear capabilities. So it has made uh, the world uh, less safe. And I think they, we need to point that out. Uh, somehow there is a sec sense of security by holding to this uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, but, you know, the U.S. having nuclear weapons became a threat to North Korea. That's why they developed their own nuclear weapons. Uh, in, in the first place, uh, our nuclear weapons encouraged Soviet unions to develop their own so that they become part of the uh, new arms race. And the other countries that say, did the same thing. We are a threat. And I, I uh, coming from another country, I could see the sense of uh, threat. Uh, the only way to keep, Let's take Japan, for instance. Only way to keep uh, Jap Japanese people feeling safe is by becoming part of the U.S. nuclear umbrella. And it, so by joining, uh, coming under the U.S. nuclear umbrella, we are exposing ourselves to the nuclear attacks from uh, other countries. Uh, such as China and, and Russia. So we, we, we have to make sure that people understand that we're, we're not deterring anything. We are encouraging other countries to develop their own nuclear weapons and increasing our danger. 
Uh, greetings, friends. This is Selby, Selby Ewing, um, and uh, we just had uh, several two questions that were answered um, uh, uh, offline by Seth, but I think it's important to bring those up, as well as a greeting from our Bishop Minerva G. Carcano, who says to everyone, you'll see it in the chat, uh, with all of you, I will help lead us to work on getting United Methodists and others to fully support the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And so, um, so that's a very exciting um, endeavor that we'll be uh, working on as a conference. And uh, of course, Bishop Minerva's uh, influence extends well beyond the borders of California, Nevada. Um, there was another question, um, Seth, uh, you, you um, uh, answered both of these questions offline. Um, and so I'll just reiterate real quickly, um, what are the nine states with nuclear weapons? And Seth helped us with US, Russia, UK, France, China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. And then we got another question. Um, it's hard to imagine how destructive nuclear bombs are. If an average nuclear bomb, of course, I don't know how we know. I mean, I, I think that's just sort of a relative uh, term was dropped on Austin, Texas. Will cities like San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston also be destroyed? So it's an effort to kind of quantify the effect. And Seth lets us know it's certainly conceivable, especially once you consider fallout, climate chaos, which can lead to famine and resource in, in, in insecurity. I encourage, I am sorry, I encourage you to have a look at uh, the modeling of Alec Wellerstein's new camps and see for yourself. So there is a link, I'm gonna repost this in the chat so that, so that everybody can see it. Um, and then I think we have, uh, th those are the only two uh, questions I'm gonna, uh, post that now. There we go. And then let me look. Uh, uh, I'm seeing no other uh, uh, no other questions right now, but we certainly have some time. Um, uh, and we have some uh, uh, very well uh, resourced participants. So. Um, uh, anyone who would have a question, now is the time to answer. Did uh, someone say that um, that one of our presenters was uh, Kelly? Um, Miss Kelly was in the system trying to get on. Yeah. Okay. So we don't see her um, in the uh, participants area or the uh, present presenters earlier. I, does she, is she using her name or someone else's name? I, 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 she would use her own name. Okay. And our tech will figure that out. In the meantime, uh, Roxanne has a question. What about nuclear energy? It's a good question. You know, uh, in Japan, uh, in Fukushima, earthquake and tsunami uh, exposed the danger of the so-called peaceful use of nuclear energy. Uh, there is no safe nuclear devices. As far as I'm concerned, uh, we should, you know, because we don't know what to do with the nuclear waste and it's piling up everywhere, uh, endangering the local communities and, and so forth. Uh, I, I'm, I, I think we need to be very careful about the so-called peaceful use of nuclear energy too. 
Yeah, if I, I agree. And I mean, I, if I can just add a bit about the, uh, you know, t today you may have all seen in the news, the, the story is about the U.S. agreement with Australia to provide nuclear powered submarines. These are not, these are not um, submarines necessarily with nuclear weapons, although well, they could be in theory, but that's not what we're talking about at the moment. We're talking about using nuclear energy to power them. And so you see this very, first of all, vague infiltration of nuclear energy into military usage that doesn't sound like peaceful uses to me in the first part place. But in addition, we have you know these these concerns that th these are powered with highly enriched uranium it's the same type of uranium processed uranium that would be used in a bomb and uh it's it contributes to great proliferation risks and there's of course the concerns around the fuel chain to think about like in terms of uh you know as Nova just said both on the disposal side and also in addition on the on the front end for manufacturing all of the um, the, the challenges and dangers in, in processing, uh, which really, you know, was what we saw with Fukushima too. So, um, yeah, I think something to consider there. We have another question from, from our colleague, Lee Nish, um, and it's a rather provocative question. How close to midnight are we now? <laughs> Well, I can say, I mean, if, if that's a reference to, I suppose, the uh, the doomsday clock the, the that's operated by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, which is itself a organization that's been, you know, since the dawn of the nuclear age, uh, assessing by using this metaphorical clock, uh, how close we are to the to Armageddon, essentially, by nuclear weapons. And there's a lot of you know, new Nobel Prize winning scientists on their board. And every year in January, they come out with their assessment. So according to them, at the, as of this year, we are 100 seconds to midnight is their way of saying uh, how close we are to Armageddon. So what does that even mean? I mean, that's uh, obviously it's metaphorical. But what I take from it is that it's as close as it's closer than it's ever been. I mean, that's 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 them assessing that we're in more danger than we ever were, including during the height of the Cold War um, with the with the current situation and the current buildup from nuclear armed countries. So, um, yeah, it's that that's what they say, 100 seconds uh, and uh, more more dangerous than ever. And other experts are not the only experts that say this, you know, that not everyone speaks in terms of this clock, but, you know, the, like UNIDIR, the United Nations Institute on Disarmament Research, has similarly said that it's as, as bad as it's ever been, at least since the Cold War. And, and the reasons for that, we could say, you know, are, have to do with um, the fact that there's such a failure in multilateralism these days, the fact that there's so many more countries that have nuclear weapons now than there were, and that that leaders are being so cavalier in a lot of their rhetoric, the fact that we're building uh, artificial intelligence and uh, and into our systems, and the fact that there's more cyber warfare that you know, makes these command and control systems uniquely at risk, um, and the fact that you know that 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 we are that we are only continuing to spend more and and be more uh, militarized in the way we're we're operating our systems. Yeah. So much and 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 I have one more question for Lee. Uh, uh, anyone who el any anyone else who has a question, please ask it because we're going to get into wrap up uh, pretty soon. Um, and and I'll say that uh, to our presenters, uh, Nobu and Seth, uh, I'd, I'd like to you just to consider what our call to action might be. Um, I know you've given it within the context, but let's give that at the very end, what you would hope for uh, for those of us gathered uh, to help. Um, and, and Lee's uh, next question is, what threat do we face with the prospect of nuclearization of space? Which makes me want to sort of duck and cover right now. <laughs> I'm not making light of it. I'm just um, 
I'm just uh, reacting to that. Yeah, I think we have to have an agreement at least to keep to keep the uh, nuclear out of the space. You know, because uh, nuclear attack from the space will destroy the Earth basically, and and uh, uh, we have to make sure that when we start negotiating uh, peace and uh, denuclearization of the space is the first thing we need to talk. We could talk about, and and uh, I heard that. China is developing something to that effect, uh, something uh, in, in nuclear in the space. And uh, we have to investigate that and, and make sure that they don't do that. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that the prospects for nuclear weapons in space are very, very frightening. Um, and we do have, you know, we have the Outer Space Treaty that bans stationing uh, weapons of mass destruction in space, you know, but we have also states that are um, and pushing the boundaries on this uh, as much as they can. And um, right now, you know, it doesn't help, you know, with the U.S. having just initiated the Space Force and with uh, North Korea using, you know, it's like the, basically creating uh, its orbital uh, rocket delivery systems. It's, it's, it's a very, I think, there's only one way that these, these, this arms race will go um, if we don't actually take drastic steps to uh, make the, all of the weapons and all of the developments of these weapons and use of it anywhere totally illegal. Exactly. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, Roxanne posted in the chat, I wanted to share that, um, her comment. Uh, she says, I was in Tokyo during Fukushima. We checked radiation levels every morning and with every change of wind, it was terrifying. And that was 180 plus miles away. Uh, nuclear energy cannot be considered safe. So we appreciate your comment, Roxanne. And, and I would just invite uh, Hubert and, and our wonderful panelists to, to leave us with a, a word of uh, a call to action and, and if possible, a word of hope. <laughs> that may be To see right? all of us write to the congressional leaders uh, of our own district and encourage them to uh, sign and ratify the treaty. Uh, and, and then also I think that suggestion of a municipal uh, action. Uh, I, I uh, my, my friend used to be the, uh, uh, Mayor of Oakland, and she uh, said she was going to sign the treaty uh, to keep the Oakland nuclear free, and and so forth. And and uh, Berkeley did that. Uh, San Francisco is considering it, and I think he, municipal actions uh, can encourage the federal government uh, to uh, uh, take heat uh, also, uh, but I think, uh, I, I think, you know, if we could talk about this in our congregation, when we go back to our own churches, and, and uh, uh, I, I've been talking to different people and I was surprised that not too many people knew about the treaty. Uh, and I was surprised because there was not a lot of media coverage and, and there's nothing about the treaty in, in the presidential debate. So I think we need to make this an uh, uh, issue, national and local issue. And, and, and to do that, I think the congregational awareness should be uh, raised. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Seth. Would you do you have anything to add to uh, what we can do? Well, I just want to the uh, Nova. Did you have a thought about what gives you hope, or was that it too? I thought that was the second part of the question. Me? Well, I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to cut you off from that part of the question. If you had something that gave you hope. Well, uh, that that was my my hope. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well. Yes, yeah. in that case, my answers are, are quite similar, actually. I, I was going to first say that, um, you know, I would encourage everyone to, um, I think there, there are a lot of actions that we could recommend, including calling your bank or your, or your financial institution or, and asking if, if your money's invested in nuclear weapons. Just a simple step like that caused, caused you know, the, it has begun a, a journey for a, a lot of um it's surprising what how how little it can take, but to to start a process towards making sure nuclear weapons are excluded from your portfolios. Um, but I, I think I will focus on, on the many actions uh, that you can find all of all of them uh, on our website. Uh, I can uh, w dot org um, and then look at um, resources there. Wait, let me just check. I'm <laughs> pointing you to the right place. Uh, I can w dot org and then look at um, yeah, resources and updates, and then on resources, and then you start seeing all of the projects that we have and, and papers to do things. But I was going to put in the chat, actually, this map uh, tool that our partner organization, Nuclear Ban US, created. So I just put that in the chat. And um, this is further to Nobu's suggestion. If you click on this map, it will take you uh, to a tool that lets you figure out um, who, first of all, who takes you to your representative, puts you in your uh, or your senator and shows you whether or not and how to write them about joining the ICANN legislative pledge uh, and saying that they will support the treaty. Um, having them jo join onto one of the bills at the federal level that already is in support of the treaty, such as the Eleanor Holmes Norton bill um, that um, that calls on the US to join join the TPNW. Um, so I would say do that, like work on your local uh, federal representatives and even state representatives to sign the pledge, to co-sponsor the uh, legislation that's already out there. Um, and that's pretty easy uh, to do. And if you use that tool, you could just click buttons and it will write them the letters directly. Um, and then hope, uh, yeah, that's again, a similar answer, but you know, I was reflecting on how, um, what hope means. And um, I always think about, well, that amazing day on, January, on uh, July 7th, 2017, when the TPNW was adopted. Mm -hmm. And after the vote, they go around and every country gets to give their, their statement. Uh, and in the Irish statement, um, they, of course, they quoted uh, poets, Irish poets, as they want to do. And they quoted uh, Seamus Haney, who um, uh, the foreign minister said, um, uh, I can't, I won't get it exactly word for word off the top of my head, but it was something the effect of um, uh, hope, hope is not uh, optimism, which um, is the belief that everything will turn out well, <laughs> but rather hope is something else, something rooted in the belief that there is a good that's worth fighting for. And so I think that this treaty is our very best hope. It represents the very best of what we can ask our global societies to do. Um, we, you know, at every level, we can be as cynical as we like, but at every level in, in human interaction, we know that norms and law do mean things and do change behavior. And, um, and so I think that we have a, a, it's very reasonable, realistic, and important to put our hope in this treaty uh, for, um, for changing both law and norms around, around these weapons. Thank you so much, both of you, for your contributions and, uh, and all that you have added to this conversation. Uh, I just like to add that we put a lot of um, hope and uh, trust in the treaties and, and everything that's been put on the table. And we work towards the fruition of those. And uh, 
uh, putting those into action. But I also want to add as Christians um, that we uh, should all be working uh, towards uh, matters of the heart. And that has to do with how we become um, kinder, 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 more loving, just human beings. And uh, in a way that transcends our, our politics, you know, how do we put those, those uh, uh, characteristics into our policies and practices and our relationship with other nations. And uh, so for me, all of us are our best hope uh, for the future because uh, we have the opportunity to bring our best selves and to build relationships no matter what. So thank you all for, your, for being a part of this um, uh, webinar. And we, uh, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, it's Selby again. I just wanted to lift up before we close uh, a, a word from Bishop Minerva from the chat. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it felt uh, fairly important that, that Bishop lifts up less Let's ask West, West Path, which is our uh, benefit oh. administrator um, for the United Methodist Church and all of our United Methodist foundations, whether any of our dollars at these places are invested in nuclear weapons related companies. Let's connect with General uh, Board of Church and Society to see where our United Methodist strategy on denuclearization is. Let's educate our United Methodists in California and Nevada about this concern. Let's connect with our ecumenical and interfaith partners. So gentlemen, we have a commitment, a commitment from, um, from uh, one of uh, the most notable bishops in the United Methodist Church um, to, to work toward the goal of denuclearization. So I just wanted to lift that up and, and um, thank you for letting me interrupt. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you for sharing that, uh, and Thank you, Bishop. Um, I want to just uh, acknowledge that our panelists have been Reverend Nobu uh, um, Hanoki, Hanoka, um, and we, uh, we miss um, um, Mary Elia uh, Kelly. Uh, she wasn't able to get on with us, but we really were pleased to have Seth Sheldon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Hubert Ivory. I've been your moderator. And uh, if you have any additional questions or, or anything that you want to uh, have answered that you didn't get answered, or if you want to uh, get more information to our, our panelists, uh, you can contact me. Um, my uh, email address is here at the bottom. Um, I'm the current uh, chairperson of the Advocacy and Justice Committee. And uh, we look forward to working uh, more on this future, uh, of this, on these issues in the future. The Bishop has given us our marching orders, so to speak. And so we look forward to delving in and moving forward. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your presence and being with us. Uh, and so we will uh, end our uh, our time here uh, now. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Seth, and thank you, uh, Nobu, and, uh, and thank you, Tula and Selby, also for uh, helping to provide tech and, and other support with us. Thank you all.